Welcome to Tech Talks, your weekly technology podcast hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. This week, we're talking to Barb Hyman. She's the founder of Sapia. This week is a slightly shorter show than usual. I'm actually on leave, so I've not had a chance to sit down or catch up with, with Amber and Akish this week, but we do have an absolutely fabulous interview to bring you nonetheless. Barb Hyman is someone who has been described by one of my colleagues as a genius. Barb, if you're listening, then you can ask me who. Um, and she is redefining what the talent industry could look like via the use of AI. Talent, as we know, a huge concern for so many organisations, and AI or machine learning is certainly offering some interesting new proposals. As a consequence, I've got the pleasure of asking Bob, well, what does that mean for the talent industry and for recruiters? As many of you will no doubt be aware, I've worked in the talent industry as a hands-on recruiter for nine years initially, but now more generally for the last 15 years. So this is a subject close to my heart, plenty of really interesting insight, some great learnings for talent and people leaders who are trying to grow organisations and especially CEOs and founders of startups as well. So do enjoy, do listen, and we will be back next week with a full edition of Tech Talks, back to usual next week. So today I am joined by Bob Hyman, founder and CEO of Sapia. I want to say, double checking, it's not Sapia, but Sapia. Sapia. How are you? I am awesome. I'm here in Philly. Um, it's a beautiful city, beautiful day. Have you been in the States? Have you been in the States for HR Tech? Which I, was in Vegas I, last I week, have. Right? I have. And it's overwhelming. And you realize how you're walking the corridors of the um, expo, and this is what the inboxes of HIDs look like. Very overwhelming. First time in Vegas or? Um, hopefully my last, but uh, <laughs> not my first time. <laughs> yeah, no, I know that feeling. Um, <laughs> before we get into anything else then, tell us a little bit about Sapia and who Sapia are. So look, I'm going to do this a little bit differently, Dave. Mm-hmm. Um, so imagine that you're an organisation that wants to find great people because your people are your brand. You know, and retail, the last meter, really drives whether or not you're going to be successful in converting your customers. And you get a lot of people applying. Maybe you don't get a lot of people applying, but you need to do that really fast. In retail, not having a sales manager in role reduces your retail sales by about 20% week on week. So speed matters and um, quality matters. And in a world where there aren't many candidates who are applying for 20 jobs or so, you need to make it really, really work for that person. That is what Sapia does. Sapia does all of the heavy lifting for you. We are a smart chat, which is very different to simple chat. Simple chat, any engineer can code. Smart chat is science. It's the ability to really understand who you are from a short conversation. So in five questions, we can figure you out, your personality traits, your comm skills, your behavioral competencies. Are you someone that's a good critical thinker? Uh, Are you someone who's going to turn up to work? Can we rely on you? Can you look around corners? Do you engage well? And the best thing about it is that not only is it fast and it's obviously built for mobile and it's chat and everyone's on chat, no one wants to do games or videos anymore, is you get feedback. So every person who does it learns about themselves. So on one level, you could say that Sapia is raising the selective, the collective self-awareness of humanity. Um, Two million people now know themselves in a way that they didn't before, but we're also helping organisations fast track to the right people fast. So smart chat, five questions smart um, and the other beauty about it is it's obviously blind so it also fixes your diversity in use so here's the question what what problems are you trying to solve by creating this incredibly smart piece of technology you were you were head of hr and marketing for six years so i'm assuming it's the challenges that you saw in that role that have kind of given rise to trying to build a platform that is sussing someone out in five questions entirely it was the time suck of interviewing Um, which is really, I think, the biggest invisible cost of hiring in an organisation. You know, all those interviews that managers are doing. And the worst thing for a manager is when you're five minutes into an interview and you're like, no, this person is not right. I'm going to waste my time, but I can't cut it short now. I need to go another half hour. So we solve for time. How do we give back time? How do we give you a short list of candidates where every one of them is a gold medalist so that your yield... Uh, is really high, that you want to hire three out of three, not one out of three, because that's incredibly valuable, your time. We also solve for businesses that get um, 
candidates who are really their consumers. So think retail or think airlines. Qantas has been one of our customers now for four years. And the head of HR for Qantas came from the head of customer. And she walked in and said, this is really crap. Like we would never treat our customers like this. Why are we treating our candidates? And so she took a very marketing lens to the whole experience and said, we need to make sure that everyone has a great experience, even the ones that we reject. We need to make sure it's fair because Qantas is a business, if you know their CEO, who's very focused on diversity and inclusion, it really matters. And we want to make sure that we are not sitting there watching videos like Homer Simpson one after the other um, to make a decision about who we interview, that we're using really smart technology to do that work for us. So we give time back. We give a massive lift to your brand. One of our clients, Walt, saw a 55-point increase in their NPS from rejected candidates using our tech. And we make sure that you can hire not in 12 days, but in one day. So Yeah, and your, tag, your tagline includes the phrase, um, phrase is, interview everyone, ghost no one. Beautiful. Perfect. I love that. Can I take that? Well, you wrote it, I assume. <laughs> it must be one of our marketing team. But I suppose that's a sum, summarization of what you're trying to say there. That that, that is exactly no, no that. one gets lost or forgotten. Yeah. How does this fit in then to the existing model? This is this is a, an interview smart tool. So there's still some selection going on, kind of in terms of CV shifting and sifting. And then I suppose there is a final interview that happens after this. No, no, just, no, it, CV. It, no CV. No uh, CV. We, we're a big believer that the CV is an outdated document. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't really say who you are. It's really more of a proxy for advantage than for potential. Um, It's very easy to game a CV, either as a candidate or as a recruiter in terms of what you're looking for. Most most recruiters look at CVs in two seconds. What are you really looking for? You're you're relying on heuristics like the school they went to, the sports they might have played to make assumptions and inferences. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done, not by us, by others, that shows that the CV doesn't really predict anything from a performance perspective. So a lot of our clients use us because they don't want the CV. They actually really want to know who someone is, their story, their values, what matters to them, and they want to make it a completely fair and blind process. So Thanks the interview, you, interview everyone. The yeah. And the thing is that you don't just get a score. I think a lot of the challenge with AI is what you get out of it is just a number. And, like, no one wants to believe a number, you know. So you're 70, I'm 80. Why? Like, you want to know what's the difference between you and me. And what we do with our technology is we effectively create the new resume, which is a profile that allows you to see what are your strengths and weaknesses, why did you score the way you did. You can see the interview if you want to read it because you're about to meet that person. It gives you guidance around what questions to ask in an interview that are data-driven. They're not your favourite questions like, what animal would you be? So you're bringing more science and more intelligence and you're making hiring managers basically smarter through that process. So is this enabling organisations to hire people that they would normally or maybe traditionally have overlooked? 100%. A huge part of it is potential and, and, and capturing undiscovered potential, which is kind of critical now when... I heard a stat at HR Tech from IBM that by 2025, there will be a global deficit of 76 million IT workers. So instead of paying more on job boards, which a lot of companies are doing, it's not going to get you very far. You need to rethink what you're looking for. And finding people with the right values and attributes and training them for skills, is it just has to be a, a skill that companies start to, to, you know, a muscle they start to build. Because prior to hitting record, we, we were talking about, well, what do you want to talk about on this podcast? You know, being very transparent with the audience, we always want to get the best out of people by getting them on the subjects that they they feel comfortable talking about. And you were talking about the fact that there are no people to fill jobs, casinos and restaurants shutting down because there aren't the staff, you know, drive through restaurants instead of restaurants because they haven't got the waiting staff. And I suppose it's it's a qualification to that opening piece about there are no people to fill the jobs. You're saying that there are people to fill, the, to, to fill these jobs. They're just getting overlooked. I think there's two different problems that we're talking about there. There's a global problem of a shortage of tech skills, people with the ready profile, and the really sophisticated big tech companies are thinking very long-term about that. They're looking at programs where they go into 
developing countries like Ethiopia with 110 million people and they're imagining programs which are sourcing, recruiting and training those people to be, for instance, cloud security engineers. Our technology gets used in those instances because it's a very effective, scalable, cheap way to discover potential incredibly fast. And if you're a company that's looking to hire tech people, you're going to have to figure out um, how to actually define the ready profile, if you like, the capability profile, someone who's a good thinker, who works well with people, who's an agile um, team player. Um, That is definitely on the tech front where our technology is used. On the other front, for those businesses that are looking to find staff where you know, there are in short supply, usually in retail roles, hospitality, customer service roles. The only way you're actually ever going to get there is to move incredibly fast. So you're looking to make offers in a day at most, not three weeks. And, you know, what's astonishing to me, if you go through a large number of companies, it'd be familiar to you how cumbersome that process is and how impossible it is to think about even getting a job within a week, let alone a day. So you, you have to you have to restructure and reimagine the way you recruit now if you stand any chance of getting talent. Um, and you also need to look much further afield if you're looking for tech talent. So it stands to reason that from a scalability point of view, you would absolutely be for the opportunity of going to a developing economy where there's a huge amount of potential and potentially a a massively untapped talent pool, and your tool being the thing to fuel the growth of that organisation, that territory. But what about the traditional HRD who's sitting in a Western economy, who believes in the human factor, who doesn't like hybrid working or remote working and is still not convinced by it? What what are the blockers here? What are the the kind of the... What's what's stopping the industry from embracing that vision of going into, say, in Ethiopia and hiring Mm. en masse and unlocking some of the potential there? So I I could be a bit cheeky here and say, you know, how's that working for you? Um, That approach of insisting that people come into the office, you know, in a a sort of a professional role. Um, It is now, you know, the best thing about COVID is it just massively accelerated that people have flexibility and want flexibility and that's going to stay. Um, you know, it was a bias that I saw in my organisation from leaders that I can't trust you if I can't see you. Um, and so there's an enormous amount of rethinking that still has to happen at the HID level and at the C-suite level around, you know, how do we build a culture of trust, a culture of high performance without using some of these, what I think are really hideous tools where you're tracking what people are doing. I think that's a recipe for killing trust. Um, how do we better understand um, what people's accountabilities are and um, how we manage to that and how do we use technology to bridge between ourselves, the organisation, the manager and the individual. So, you know, I, I, I talk a bit about that connection is the new culture that, um, you know, we used to go into the office and that was our way of imbibing the culture um, and feeling our way around and, you know, having opportunistic mentoring conversations. But now that's not going to happen anymore. And so, you know, I don't necessarily think we all have the answer, but we need to think about where technology is going to play a really critical role in helping build connections. And the beauty is that you've got generations that are coming up now, I know with my kids in their 20s, where they're comfortable to engage on chat, to connect on chat. They don't need to speak to you. They definitely don't need to see you. Um, There are organisations like um, WordPress and Zapier who for years have hired people just via chat. They've never had video interviews. You know, that's another bias that we all still live with, which is I need to see you, David, to hire you. Um, Why do I need to see you if I'm hiring you into a contact centre or if I'm hiring you into an engineering role? So I think, you know, there's a lot of biases still to be unpacked around how we think about assessing talent, engaging with talent, building culture. And I think technology like smart chat is going to be a key player in that. We haven't we haven't nearly evolved to where we want to get to with the use of our technology. And where does this leave a traditional recruiter? Look, I, I it's you know you look at another industry like travel, right? When all those 
disruptors um, and middle players came in where you could go and source your own travel experience. Everyone thought that the travel agencies would die. But in Australia, and I think they're global actually, we have a travel agency called Flight Centre and it's thriving even post-COVID where they are moved away from just the utility of booking your trip and they're now more of a concierge. They're helping craft a great experience for you and they're making it really easy. And I think for recruiters, it's also a transition from a role which has been more administrative and more, you know, rinse and repeat to one which is more advisory, more of a talent concierge. I think what hiring managers really crave is someone to be a business partner to them. Help me figure out what my team's strengths are, maybe even what my strengths are and gaps are, and what should I be looking for to come in and support my team and support the business. And then to, you know, really coach them through that journey. The idea of a recruiter screening CVs, you know, no one's time is served well by screening CVs um, or doing phone screens where they're asking questions to infer whether or not you're a great culture fit like that. That is a very old fashioned, outdated set of roles for a recruiter. And I would hope that most recruiters would feel liberated by not having to do that and playing much more of a meaningful advisory role. You started your career as a solicitor. You've been a project leader, business development manager, learning and development manager, head of marketing sponsorship, head of HR and marketing, uh, EGM, people and culture, non-exec director, and now here you are, CEO and founder of a business. What lesson would you, or maybe not lesson, but what advice would you try and impart having gone through the experience that you've gone through over the last couple of years with Sapia, to anyone else who is thinking, I've got a problem to solve here, I think there's a solution, but they're not sure how to go about starting getting that off the ground. So I'm obviously female, <laughs> and that that has really shaped, um, you know, my decisions in that my main advice is I think women tend to overthink things, um, and, you know, we all know that the, the facts around women get promoted on performance and men on potential is just frigging do it. Like if you think that the men all there in those C-suite positions are smarter than you, frankly, they're not. Um, and they're, they're there because of connections, um, sometimes because of their gender, not because of talent. And so my advice to young people in particular of all genders is don't go and do more university. I don't think there's any returns from that. I think it's a safe pathway and it's a, um, a low return pathway. Go and work in sales. I wish I had taken a job when I was 18 or 23 when I graduated in sales. You learn so much about people, about yourself, the skills that you acquire in being in a sales role, you have to listen. You have to, you know, um, really empathise. You have to learn how to communicate. Um, you have to back yourself because you get rejected. So go and work in sales. Don't go and study. Um, and if you're a female, don't overthink it. Just do it and surround yourself with great friends and mentors to, you know, prop you up along the way. Bob, I really appreciate your time today. I hope you have a successful time uh, for the rest of the time that you're in the US and then a safe trip home back to Australia. Thank you so much. 